Hey everybody, this is Mr. Moffin coming back at you with another AP government video. This is our second video focusing in on topic 1.1, Ideals of Democracy. Now, last time we were here, we were talking about the impact of uh, Thomas Hobbes and how, uh, you know, through his belief in the Enlightenment and the use of logic and reason to explain, you know, things, uh, Hobbes is going to come up with the uh, the explanation as to why we need government via his work, the uh, Leviathan, to basically say that, you know, since we are more than willing to use any and all rights that exist, including rights to steal, assault, and kill one another, that we need to have government in place to basically protect us from one another. Uh, and note, this is kind of a, a negative view towards human beings that we see through Hobbes. So in other words, you got to have strong government to protect wicked people from uh, each other. Uh, now, today we're going to take a look at another, even more impactful Enlightenment era philosopher uh, on the foundation of the United States, and that's going to be this guy right here, a fellow Englishman by the name of John Locke. Now, note, uh, John Locke is going to be writing a little bit later in English history, whereas you know Hobbes is writing during the worst of the English Civil War. You're going to be seeing Hobbes writing more towards the end of the 17th century, uh, when we start to see, you know, when we have the Restoration, and then when we have, in 1688, the what would, what's known as the Glorious Revolution, uh, which basically, in that Glorious Revolution, you basically saw, you know, people kind of rise up to overthrow uh, what was viewed as, you know, the, uh, the poor, uh, you know, effectiveness uh, of the monarchy under King James II, and wanted a a government that was much more responsive to the people. Uh, they will bring in what will become uh, King William and Queen Mary. Uh, and, and that experience is going to have an important impact on, uh, you know, John Locke's work in terms of writing about government philosophy. Now, like his predecessor, Thomas Hobbes, John Locke is also going to believe in this concept known as the state of nature. That, in other words, just like Hobbes wrote, we as human beings in our original form, uh, we enjoy unlimited rights. And once again, that's anything and everything that you can conceive of from what anything you can say to murdering one another. Uh, but here's the key difference, though. Unlike Hobbes, who believes that we are really wicked people, evil people uh, by definition, Locke has a much more positive attitude about mankind that, you know, human beings actually are good. They actually are moral. Uh, they are rational. And with that kind of a different attitude about, you know, the nature of human beings, that's going to have an impact in terms of, you know, why government exists, what its function is, etc. And once again, just like his predecessor, Locke is going to believe in the idea of we have natural rights and that's a result of natural law. So all this kind of idea of, of the, the, the idea of you know, humans in nature, you know, etc., and the rights that go along with it. Locke believes in all that same stuff that Hobbes is. So that's why Hobbes is so important foundationally. But note, if we are to go along with Locke's theory that human beings are good and moral and rational, then the question is, why do we need to have government? You know, Hobbes once again wrote that you need to have government to protect people from one another because they're wicked and awful, and that, that strong government has to be kind of just dropped on people. In his second treatise on government, Locke is going to write, eh, that's not how it, how it goes. Uh, Locke believes that government, and this is critical, government comes from the people themselves. It's not foisted from upon high by some mighty king necessarily. It's organic. It comes from the people, from the ground up, if you will. And note, all right, that is critical because, you know, if you believe that government is to come from the people, then that means that the only valid government that exists is what we call government with the consent of the governed. In other words, when we talk about the idea of popular sovereignty, popular sovereignty means, you know, with the consent that with the consent of the people, that the people are sovereign, that the people are the final say in terms of how government is to be run. So in other words, if people are the final say of government, therefore the only valid government has to come from the people. If the government itself does not come from the people itself, it's an invalid government. And that is critical. Hobbes doesn't 
really want government to come from the people. It has to kind of put its boot on people. Locke says, no, it's got to come from the ground up, from the people themselves. Now, the question is, according to Locke, you know, why do we as human beings, why do we want to create a government? You know, if, if we're the ones choosing to create government, why? Why would we do that? You know, because if you have government, government inherently limits rights. It just does by definition. Now, from Hobbes' perspective, you need government to limit rights to protect people from one another. But here's the difference, though. Under Hobbes, Hobbes doesn't need the people's consent. Locke says you've got to have the people's consent. So in other words, where does government come from? Government comes when the people make rational decisions to give up some of their own natural rights. Here's the thing. you know, With Hobbes, people don't voluntarily give up their rights. Why would you? Why would you give up part of your freedom? Locke says that we as human beings are rational enough and good enough to know that we must sacrifice some of our natural rights. Rights such as the right to kill and to rape and to, you know, steal from one another. We give up, we voluntarily give up those rights. Well, why would we want to do that? We do that so that we create this thing called government that will then exist to protect the remaining rights. So in other words, if you want to have a sense of stability and protection in your desire to own property, to travel where you want, to pray how you want, if you want to have protection of those rights that you may hold dear, then you have to be willing to give up other rights. You have to be willing to give up the right to steal and kill to be able to have this thing called government to protect the other things. Now, sometimes, you know, some people to make it easier will kind of say, well, we give up our bad rights to keep our good rights. I mean, that's very simplistic. I probably wouldn't put it down on a test anywhere, but if that makes it easier to understand, then that that's fine. Uh, but that's the thing. And that is important because with that understanding, Locke then has a different definition for what government is compared to Hobbes. Hobbes's basic basic role for government is to instill stability and order. It has to do that. For Locke, Locke believes that government exists to protect our rights, the rights that we have not surrendered. All right? We've surrendered the right to kill and steal. But we create government to protect what we consider to be more important rights. We create government to protect our right to pray and to speak and to assemble, to own property. We have, that's why we have government. So government exists to protect those rights. Now that then kind of gives a sense of expectations of government that are a little bit higher than what Hobbes is talking about. You know, Hobbes only expects order, you know, stability. Locke is saying, no, we expect more from government in reality. The people expect more when we create government. So then the question becomes, all right, if we have a certain standard, the government exists to protect our rights, well, what if the government comes up short? And, and think about this. Is that even possible? Can government fall short of its expectations? Absolutely. Why? Because according to Locke, once again, government comes from the people. And people, by definition, are imperfect. So government, by definition, is imperfect. So knowing that government is not perfect by definition, what then are we to do if government does not live up to its expectations in terms of being able to protect our rights that, that we value? Well, Locke has an answer for that. Locke says that if government does not meet its expectations, then the people have the right, the right to overthrow that government and then replace it with a new one, a new one that the people have created that will protect those rights as a government should and must. So that's a critical thing. Under Hobbes' thinking, 
you get the government you get. As long as that government is just instilling order, that's all that matters. That's it. And generally speaking, government's pretty good at that. You know, if, as long as, you know, uh, an entity has enough power, it can instill stability and, and order. Now, it may not protect your rights, but it can instill order. Well, Locke is saying that, well, you know, government has a higher expectation. And if it doesn't live up to expectations, we are not going to just be victims. We have the right. And then, you know, what's also then implied, of course, is not just the right, but really the responsibility to change that government, to replace it with one that we think will be better for us. That is important because what Locke tells us is that government is not omnipotent. It can't be. It's not perfect. All right. Government comes from us. Therefore, we can replace it. Government is not something that is dropped on us and we just deal with kind of like Hobbes would say. So that that's going to be critical. OK, now, as we get into the 18th century, the 1700s, we're going to see even more modern uh, thinkers kind of expand on what Locke has been talking about. And that's going to include uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, pictured right here from France. Now, what Rousseau is going to do is kind of talk about this idea of the expectations of government that Locke you know, espouses in his writings. And he's going to develop what he calls the social contract. In, in other words, that you know he kind of codifies, so to speak, what Locke is kind of talking about you know, in terms of expectations. And so what Rousseau is saying is that we as people, for lack of a better phrase, we create a contract with governments. We create a contract. And that, I think that can be a lot easier to understand. The idea being that, you know, hey, in a contract, there's expectations by both parties. And in this social contract, it is between us, the people, and the government. And that means that there's expectations by both, you know, and the expectation is we give up the right to steal and kill. That's our part of the, of the contract. And the government, as their end of the contract, they protect everything else. You now, the good rights, if you will, right to protect property, life, liberty, etc. And just like in a, in a proper contract, there's provisions for what happens if either side doesn't live up to its end of the bargain. If we as the people don't live up to our end of the bargain and we actually do assault and, and kill one another, well, then that allows the government to impose penalties on us, uh, paying fines, jail, maybe even execution, depending on the situation. So in other words, if, if we do not live up to our expectations, that's considered a crime and there are penalties for that. But at the same time, though, as we said earlier, government also has an expectation. And if it does not live up to its end, of the bargain to protect property and life and liberty, etc., then as we said before with Locke, then the people have the right then to change that government. So in other words, if either end breaks the contract, there's provisions for that. And, you know, also to kind of round it out today, also be aware of the importance of another key French philosopher, Charles uh, de Montesquieu, pictured right here, that is also going to talk about you know, when we talk about government, he's going to be talking about the framework for government, that if you are talking about a government that is going to protect us from tyranny, okay, and note, all right, you know, if you're talking about Locke and, and Rousseau, we have to have government that protect, protects our rights, okay? So in order to have our rights protected, we have to have a government that is not going to be tyrannical. We have to have a government that won't violate our rights. And according to Montesquieu here, what do you need to have in government to make sure that it doesn't become tyrannical and that it will actually protect our rights? Well, you got to have this thing in part in, included called separation of powers. So the idea being is that you can't have this the people you can't have the people that make the laws also enforce the laws, and the people that enforce the laws should not be the ones that interpret what the laws mean, and the ones that interpret the laws should not be the ones that make the laws. So, in other words, if you are diversifying the responsibilities of government spreading it out, separating it, if you will, then that's going to reduce the power of the government to be tyrannical. That's going to be significant. Because if you put all of those powers uh, under one roof, if you will, with one body or even one person, you can see how that's going to create tyranny. All right, folks, we're going to leave it there with the impact of some of these key enlightenment philosophers. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.